Hello everybody and welcome to Unit 2 Biology Area Study 1. Today we are going to be looking at genotypes and phenotypes. So through this area study we're going to be looking at the symbols that may be used when writing genotypes um, for specific alleles. Um, we'll be looking at dominant and recessive phenotypes and also what co-dominance and incomplete dominance looks like, and we'll be looking at the proportionate influences of genetic material and environmental and epigenetic factors that they can have on phenotypes. So we'll make a start. Well, a genotype is basically looking at things at a gene level, and a phenotype is looking at something, I like to think, physical to see like what it might look like or actually be like inside of us. So the genotype, we would usually maybe use letters to represent those. And then I like to think phenotype is what does that actually represent? What does the genotype represent? In terms of genotype, we can have what we call a dominant allele and a recessive allele. And we usually represent a dominant allele with a capital letter and a recessive allele with a lowercase letter. So a dominant allele is some variant of a gene. So an allele is a alternate form of a gene that might mask the effect of the recessive allele. So say that you have the dominant and the recessive. So say we've got like a capital A and a lowercase a. Whatever the capital A stands for is what will prevail. Okay. The recessive allele is the variant of the gene that might be masked. Okay. The only way that a recessive allele will end up being shown and be present is if both of those alleles are going to be recessive. We also have the words homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous is where both of the alleles are either both dominant or both recessive, whereas heterozygous is where you've got one dominant and one recessive allele. So you can see here that maybe having a hitchhiker's thumb will be one allele and having a regular thumb is not. And so them being the same, we could say is homozygous, them being different is going to be heterozygous. All right, so we need to be familiar with this vocabulary because it's going to be important when we are actually figuring out and doing some Punnett squares. So in terms of phenotype, phenotype is what those genotypes will represent, okay? So we have what we call complete dominance, where we will have a dominant allele and a recessive allele, and where the dominant allele will mask whatever the recessive allele is. So say I use a capital S for straight hair, I would use a capital letter to show dominant, and then that would mean a lowercase s would represent the recessive, so curly hair. And I can write out my genotype. So a capital S, capital S, the genotype would be represented that way. And then the phenotype would be what, what does that mean? So we know that dominant is straight, so it has to be straight hair. Lowercase s, lowercase s, we know that if they're both recessive, then it has to be whatever the recessive is which the phenotype for that will therefore be curly hair. If we have a heterozygous, so capital S, lowercase s, that would be straight because the dominant is going to mask the recessive allele. And so if I have two parents, say one parent is heterozygous, okay, so capital and lowercase, and the other parent is also heterozygous, so capital and lowercase, I can fill in my Punnett square to find out what the likelihood of those offspring are going to be to have those traits. So it's one quarter homozygous dominant, a half heterozygous, but still going to be straight haired, and then one quarter of a chance of it being curly haired if both of the parents are heterozygous for straight hair. In terms of incomplete dominance, this is where a new phenotype, an intermediate phenotype is created. So say we have one um, parent that is black feathers, let's say it's a bird, we have one parent that is white feathers. When we combine those, we could actually end up with a third phenotype, okay? And that third phenotype is grey, represented by the genotype BW. And so say I were to breed two heterozygous grey 
okay, so the BW and BW, I could end up with one quarter black feathered, one half gray feathered, and one quarter white feathered. And so here I've written up the top a genotypic ratio and at the bottom a phenotypic ratio. So hopefully that's making a little bit more sense with what the words genotype and phenotype are referring to. We then have what we call codominance, and codominance is where both the alleles are equally expressed. So let's still say I have black feathers represented by capital B, capital B, and white feathers represented by capital W, capital W. In this case, though, my heterozygous, my BW, is going to be black and white feathers or black and white spots or whatever it may be, but it's a combination of both being equally expressed. So it's not forming a new intermediate phenotype like it is in incomplete dominance. In co-dominance, it's expressing both of them. And a real life example that we look at here is blood type. Okay, so if you are, say, um, have one parent that's heterozygous for blood type A, okay, and then blood type AB, their child could have these following um, outputs as well. So I've written the genotypes here. Um, with the capital I's, that's how we're going to write the genotypes, and the phenotype would be that blood type A, blood type AB, blood type B, blood type O. I'm going to link at the bottom of this video the explanation of me actually going through this specifically. Um, it's a whole separate video that I've created, so you can take a look at that. It'll be in the description box below. And the final part is looking at what actually impacts phenotype. So the two things that are going to have a real impact is what the genotype is, okay, because phenotype is based on genotype, and the environment, okay. It can also be impacted what, what we call epigenetics. So epigenetics are basically just changes to an organism's phenotype that result from modifications to gene expression. So their influence on the phenotype is at a molecular level and the molecular interactions with DNA that might modify the expression of particular genes. And so these epigenetic mechanisms might boost or inhibit the transcription of genes into proteins. So here we can see the presence or the absence of, say, epigenetic factor X causes gene Z to be turned on if it's present and gene Z to be turned off if it's absent, resulting in if it's turned on, the protein will be produced to form a specific phenotype called phenotype A. And then if it's absent, that means that protein won't be produced, which means a different phenotype might result. So in order to give you a bit of a summary, um, this is directly from Ed Rollo as well, but basically Genes um, might be influenced by carrying the instructions necessary for the creation of proteins, but once they're created, they might interact with each other and contribute to the overall phenotype, and that is a heritable change. The environment, however, things like temperature, nutrition, sunlight, they may also affect the phenotype for that particular individual, but that's not going to be heritable. Okay, so like dyeing your hair a new colour, that's not going to affect your offspring. Your offspring aren't going to end up with red hair if you dye your hair red. And then epigenetics are things that, like we said, are environmental factors that can cause epigenetic modification. So they might influence the level of transcription of a gene, um, which is looking at like the proteins being made. And we look a little bit more about protein synthesis in unit three. Um, but also by affecting transcription, epigenetic modifications might influence how much of a protein might be produced. And so um, somatically, these can be heritable, although some epigenetic changes may also be passed on to offspring during reproduction as well. If you have any questions regarding genotype and phenotype, please do leave them in the comments below and I'll try to get to them when I can. Otherwise, have a great day. Thank you.